Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Skaberg here with Consolidated Planning Group. Um, we are happy that you are here with us uh, today. Um, today, we are um, partnering with Armando Bernal, and he's going to um, tell us a pretty awesome story today, and I think it's going to be pretty encouraging. I'm really excited. I think we've um, partnered with Armando um, once in the past and that's had a, a webinar with you in the past. Um, I always like to just kind of go through a few housekeeping items right off the bat. We, we do have almost 150 people signed up for today. Um, today's webinar. So we are going to get to as many questions as we can. We are in webinar mode. And what that means is that we can't see you or hear you, but we know you're there and we are glad you're here with us today. Um, so we do invite you throughout the presentation to put your questions in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that chat box for Armando and we'll get to um, just as many questions as we can as we're um, going through this. Next slide, please. Um, Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning advisory and consulting firm. Um, we are nationally certified as social security advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We help families just like yours plan for the future of a loved one with a disability. And we help answer questions such as, who's going to care for my child when I'm gone? How much money do I need to fund a special needs trust? How and when should I apply for state and federally funded programs? Um, what do I say? What do I not say when I'm doing these kind of things? And how do I maintain that eligibility? So um, when it comes to planning, your situation is specialized. And we always invite you um, to, um, to schedule a free consultation with us. Uh, we want to learn more about your journey, where you've been, the planning that you've done so far. We're not here to rain on any great relationships or any planning that you've already got set up. Um, a lot of people work with us to complement what they already have in place, maybe what they have in place through work or what they've worked on with other advisors. There's, there is fewer than one tenth of a percent of financial advisors that are actually nuanced and special needs. And, you know, we just always say that your situation is specialized, so it's really, really important to work with a specialist. Today's um, presentation is being recorded. Um, everybody is going to get a copy of today's slides as well as a link to the recording um, at the end of the slides, we're going to have contact information for Armando, and there also um, is going to be a specific QR code at the end of the presentation where you can schedule your free personalized uh, consultation. We offer um, online scheduling, which we think is um, more favorable for most people, so they, they, you can check our calendar and check the calendars of you and your loved one that want to participate in the appointment and kind of schedule it at a, a time that is convenient for you. Next slide, please. Um, we offer um, protection plans, lifetime care plans. We help people set up ABLE accounts, and we really do a lot of ab advocacy um, in the way of our um, podcast and YouTube channel. We have a Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel, so if you're visiting us for the very first time, there are over 300 webinars surrounding topics on, um, you know, families with a loved one with a disability, planning, um, Social Security, special needs, trust, guardianship, you name it, it is out there. And you can subscribe to the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel uh, for free. So having said that, enough about all of that. Ar Armando, we are just so happy that you're here with us today. Um, and I certainly just want to, um, you know, t tell us a little bit more about yourself and, um, and, and what you're going to tell us about today. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so my name is Armando. I had done a uh, webinar, as as Allison said, um, about maybe a month or two ago, and and that went you know really well. And now I'm back again. And this one's going to be more about my story about growing up with autism. And I'll tell a little bit more about my um, myself as we get into more of the presentation. As Allison said, please by all means ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, Allison will be um, stepping in and, and uh, asking me any of the questions that you put in the chat or anything like that. But what I'd like to do with this presentation is really discuss what my perception of the world has been, right? Of growing up with autism, of being told that I can't do things, that I may be able to do things, having my family being told that I wasn't going to accomplish very much in my life, right? And at, at this point, being able to be here with each and every one of you, uh, and and try and provide a sense of, of of hope and understanding and enlightenment in the sense that 
those diagnosed with autism are able to do so many things. So there is not really anything that can uh, prevent them from accomplishing some goal that they may have for themselves in life. Um, so again, this is just one neurodivergent story. There are many individuals with autism out in the world, but this just happens to be mine. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. So like I said, my name is Armando. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. But before that, I was diagnosed with autism at three. And doctors told my mother that I might as well learn sign language because I was never going to be able to speak, that I was not going to be able to graduate from an elementary or a middle school or a high school, that I was going to have to be at home. My mother was going to have to feed me for the rest of my life. I wasn't going to be potty trained. All of these really terrible things to tell a, a mother with a newborn pretty much um, or a toddler that they're not going to be able to become anything that she may have dreamed about when I was little. Um, and we didn't grow up with a lot of money. And so that was really it from the doctor. And he said, oh, off you go. I have 60 other patients just like you. Um, but best of luck with you and his life, right? And my mother was able to uh, stand up to that doctor and really say, no, that that's not going to be his life, that I'm going to do everything I can for him. And growing up, I my mother couldn't afford um, applied behavior analysis therapy. And if you've seen my previous webinar, I discussed that briefly. Um, but she did have access to the free public library. And so what that meant was that she was able to check out books about autism, whether they were medical jargon or not, and try and learn as much as she possibly could uh, to support me. Through her, as well as my sister and my father, I was able to grow up and be able to eventually learn how to talk. Um, with speech therapy and other therapy support, I was able to get that from my public school system. And eventually I became a special education teacher where I worked with elementary students that were also nonverbal, with parents that may, just like each one of you, come and say that my child's life is over before it begins, that it may, that autism may be a cancer for them, that they may not be able to learn how to take care of themselves. I'm here to tell you that that's not true, right? But I wanted to do more for these individuals that I worked with. Um, and so I learned more about applied behavior analysis, and I became a board certified behavior analyst. And even then, I still found more and more things from parents that were saying that there was a real struggle for this. So as I grew up and I, I learned more about um, special education and autism and myself, even, um, I became a podcast host from a podcast called A Different Path um, that led me into doing more special ad education advocacy, where I would focus and support other individuals with autism, not just uh, here in Houston, Texas but also really around the world. Uh, I'm now the owner of a company, my company, Autism International Consulting, that provides in-home and now in-clinic ABA therapy, where we support all ages. So that means from 18 months to 15 years old, seven years old, 25 years old, there is no age limit for us. And we do as much as we possibly can for that individual, for that family, for those guardians, whoever it may be, um, here in Houston more specifically, but also, as I mentioned, internationally, working with families in South Africa and Pakistan and uh, in Ireland, many other places as well. Because again, this need is so high. If anyone is not aware, the ratio currently for having been diagnosed with autism is one in 36. One in 36 children are currently being diagnosed with autism as we speak. And it's only going to increase based on the trend lines. And we'll discuss that further, right? But bottom line, it's it's so significant and so I'm so incredibly thankful to have each of you here tonight, today, wherever, whenever you may be listening to this, and and showing that you you can be there for your children, that we can all do something to better support the the kids that we just want to see as successful as possible. So a little bit of background based on how we're going to break down this presentation here, right? It's going to be this stage of personal growth for me. We're going to discuss why we may be here today different kinds of treatment opportunities, my own growth with my neurodivergence, and hopefully have a mindset change, right? Where we can change our belief in what individuals with autism can do and change it more into seeing the possibilities of everything that can still be done, even with that diagnosis. Finally, looking into uh, taking a chance on opportunities and then ending with a viewpoint on living today. Um, and I, I saw that we have a chat, um, Allison, was it a question? How can I help them? Yeah, it says, um, are you a Medicaid provider? Does your does your firm accept Medicaid? It's a great question. Yes, we do take Medicaid. So we take all private insurances as well as Medicaid. And that was a choice for myself and my sister. It's a family business at Autism International Consulting. 
uh, where we didn't want families that didn't have a lot of money like mine growing up to, to suffer in that way. So we do take all Medicaid providers as well. Um, and we also take all private insurances. So Aetna, TRICARE, Blue Cross, really anything you can think of, we will take. That's a really great question. Um, it's a really big deal. Um, I just want to just pause and say that's a big deal because a lot of the providers that are out there simply don't take Medicaid and kids are getting SSI and Medicaid or maybe they're getting MDCP or what have you that they've got going on. Um, so I, I love that because a lot of times families are um, – they're kind of um, handcuffed by the limited amount of providers and the waiting list that's going um, along with these providers. So yay you for that. So you get five stars already and you're two slides into your presentation. So um, anyway, carry on. It's a great start. I know. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, and that, that was a really great question because you're right. A lot of providers won't take Medicaid and we say, why, you know, why is that? And why, if, if, you know, you, you keep score in that sense, right? We're also the only autistic owned ABA company in Houston, Texas. And I get a lot of, you know, congratulations, that's so great. But for me, it's also, well, why am I the only autistic owned ABA company? I, I want to try and, and support as many autistic voices as I can and maybe provide myself as a model for other autistic individuals to say, hey, you know, if they can do it at Autism International Consulting, then so can I. And that's and that's exactly what we try to do here, right? Um, but as we continue, again, this question comes up, right? Why are we here today? Why do I have this many people interested in my story? And it's because transparency and self-advocacy can bring us together. Again, in my previous webinar, I talk about the controversies of ABA, and that's a different story, right? But what's so significant is to have an open mind as well as to have an, an open door to allow this transparency and self-advocacy to flourish, where it's you asking me any kind of question you could possibly think of, and I'll answer it for you. Being able to speak on how do I provide self-advocacy for the children we serve? And that's any age, right? Not just a 15 or 20 year old that can speak, but also my 18 month year olds, my two year olds, my three year olds. If they have a toy that we're trying to play with them with and, it, and the child says no, then that's their self-advocacy to say, I don't wanna play with that right now. And we accept that. And that's how our therapy usually goes is that we really let it be child-led as well as having our parents and our guardians that we work with as those partners. So we'll dive in for a couple of these reasons, right? Um, we, I, I imagine that a lot of us here just wanna have this ability for our children to start communicating, to allow them to be independent and maybe even make friends. A lot of times with my teenagers more specifically, is I get a lot of concern for what well, my, my child doesn't have friends right now, or even my adult um, patients is that they don't have friends, that they're just at home all of the time and they don't have anyone to talk to, right? It's, it's important to see other neurodivergent individuals demonstrate that, that that is a possibility and that there are ways to, to reach those individuals and make those kind of friends, right? Giving them opportunities trying to figure out how to make communication click with your child to provide their wants and needs. We talked earlier uh, with the consolidated planning group about making sure that your child was ready for their future to have some kind of financial support there. It's, it's significant for that child to be able to communicate those needs. Like what do they want to save for? What do they want to uh, better support themselves with, right? And more specifically, I think it's also um, the reason why these presentations happen is to stop that worry, right? That what happens, and it's a little morbid, but what happens when you're gone, right, to your child, letting them, letting you know that your child's going to be okay, and provide that kind of reinsurance to let you know that everything bad in the world is not going to end up happening to them, that you can stop feeling like you have to live for them, and that they can finally live their life as well. Yes, Allison. <laughs> A uh, couple of questions um, so far. Does your company do happen to do virtual ABA? We try to. Uh, we we do a lot of in person as well. Um, so, but we do virtual parent trainings for sure. Um, and we can look into using that for the insurance model as well. We also have private pay, and we do payment plans. So it's kind of like pay as you can kind of situations. Um, for anyone wondering about our in-clinic as well, our clinic's going to be located off of Rayford and Sawdust Road, and that's in the Woodlands, Texas. It's like right off of 45. Okay. And so we have another one. Does your firm work with children who can speak and are considered high-functioning, like all across the board? Yes. I mean, is there is there a, I guess what we should say is there is, is there a specific segment that you don't work with or you don't work best with? 
No, not particularly. Excuse me, I'm coming over a cold, everyone. Um, not particularly. We work with all functionalities in all ages. Um, I find that usually the functionalities that are higher, right, it's going to be more about how to live on their own. So what I describe it as is that we work on how how do you date? How do you live on your own? How do you get a job? Um, how do you make friends? Whereas I also work with the lower functioning, which are the typical, hey, you know, touch arm, show me clapping, you know, do this and that kind of thing. We work with all of them again, because I'm well aware that I'm probably on that higher end of the spectrum. But that doesn't mean that I don't struggle, right? That I, I have a lot of hard times with social activities, or I have a lot of hard times with um, interacting with others. But through my own therapy, as well as um, the, the support system I have around me, my family and my now my wife, who I've been married with for a year, um, I've, I've been able to overcome those things. So yeah, to answer your question, we, we handle all functionalities. There is really no one that we say no to. <laughs> So I know you're going to talk to tell us more about your story and how you became independent. One other question I have on, on helping people, you know, I know that we work with a lot of families that have kids that are transitioning, uh, which honestly, quite honestly, could be anywhere from ages 16 to 26, 28, 30, even depends on their development on when they're really transitioning. And a lot of our families are still remain hopeful and optimistic that their kids are going to be it may be semi-independent, maybe they're not there yet. So for that kid that's 21 years old, still living at home, they have some skills, there's still some things that need to be developed. Um, do you have like a specific track for them to get them as independent as possible? Is, is that a good fit for your organization? Absolutely. So the way that we handle that, right, is to determine that functionality first off, to determine where that child's going to be. Uh, but then we determine what are the skills that are currently lacking. So I'll give a couple of examples here. Is that I have a, uh, I had a 17 year old, he's now graduated from our program, but I had a 17 year old where mom was scared that he was gonna live at home for the rest of his life because he had no real skills. But what we do is that my therapist, as well as myself, we don't see ourselves as teachers at that point. We're more of a resource for these individuals because more often than not, these individuals do want to live on their own or they want to have some kind of level of independence. So we work with them on it and say, hey, where are we lacking here? Do you need help with groceries? Do you even know how to get a job or what a resume is? And often that, you know, for the higher functioning kiddos, they'll say, well, I don't know what a resume is. And we say, well, let's teach you that. Let's go ahead and help you because that's going to get you the job. And for this 17 year old, he specifically wanted to work with cars. He loved cars and loved everything about them. I said, wouldn't it be great if you could work on these cars and see the insides of them? And he was like, absolutely. That sounds amazing. Well, if you need to do that, we need to get you a resume. We need to practice your interview skills. And we would do all of this with these individuals to a point where we took him to different businesses around the, the neighborhood and had him drop off resumes. And even though it was electronic, these individuals understood about the diagnosis and all of that. And, and allowed him to do that for the practice and eventually was able to get a job. And now he works at one of the um, car dealerships in the Woodlands. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Please continue. Yeah, absolutely. No, these are all really great questions. Keep them coming, you guys. So what I was mentioning earlier right, is understanding why we're here, but also what are the options here? And again, I don't want to go into like crazy details about uh, ABA and the controversies. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that at a later time, but also we have another webinar for that. Um, is understanding that there are a wide variety of therapies that are available, no matter the age here, right? Depending on, it depends on the individual and who's providing it. But more often than not, these are available to really any age if you can find um, those individuals willing to work with that. So we have occupational therapy that work toward um, managing uh, motor skills and being able to manage an individual. Speech therapy, being able to work on uh, the ability to communicate. There's music therapy, which works on communication, but through song, through singing, that allows that person to have an easier perspective. Uh, we have equestrian therapy, where it's working through uh, managing uh, different kinds of horses, being able to manage those wants and needs that may have. Cognitive behavioral therapy, play therapy, and my specialty is applied behavior analysis therapy, which is more than just practicing behavior, although that is a big part of it, that we work on a child's ability to manage themselves. But it's also going to be um, that ability to communicate, those fine motor skills, the social skills, all of these things that are available, right? And although I wasn't able to be a part of this growing up, I'm a part of it now. And it, it's been a wonder for me to be able to, to support these children. But some things to keep in mind, again, transparency and neurodivergency is so significant, is to understand these red flags. If you see on the left side here, 
of that there are times that maybe a parent's not allowed to observe a session. That should never be true. You should always be allowed to see those sessions. Forcing eye contact should never happen. Using punishment procedures is not something that we do very regular, if at all. Um, but just keep in mind that all of this being said, there are a number of therapies that are available to each of you, but there are going to be people that take advantage because unfortunately there is a lot of money in this. And it's so significant to understand your rights as a, as a parent, as well as knowing that you're a partner with these children as you grow up, much like my parents were a partner with my own neurodivergency growing up. So we had a, a similar question again, was asking about virtual therapy. We have people from all over the state. Um, and you said you had some parent coaching programs for that. And from insurance purposes, you can't do virtual therapy just yet or it's something you're looking. Just repeat that one more time for us, please. Absolutely. So we do work with parents. Um, as I mentioned, I, I work with parents all over the world. Um, and so what that looks like is that we would meet for 30 minutes or an hour um, to, and you would be discussing any kind of concerns, questions, problems that you may have with your child. Um, and we go over it as, as well. And we would meet on a weekly basis, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever is deemed appropriate for you. Um, but if we went the insurance route, then it would be uh, maybe a 30 minute or an hour long session each week. Um, again, depending on the insurance, we just have to make sure that it's approved in that point. And that's also probably the more cheaper way as well, because it's just based on co-pays and deductibles. Um, we don't offer that virtual ABA, like direct therapy kind of thing, just because we haven't seen as much progress with that. And more specifically, in my practice, we like to see the parents in person um, because it just builds that relationship and it allows the 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 child, the teenager, the adult to have a a better partnership with those individuals that they're working with as well. But that's a really good question. Uh, so this is a quote from myself, uh, and I don't do it to be, um, you know, um, snooty or whatever it may be. It's just something that's really resonated with a lot of my parents. And I thought it would resonate with each of you. Um, is that the biggest misconception about autism is, is that it looks a certain way. And in reality, autism is a spectrum of hopes, dreams, and a desire to just be yourselves. And you'll see that later with a video that I'll present. Um, it's it's this idea that as I was growing up, I, I would get the, the stereotype of, well, you don't look autistic. And, and that was always hurtful, but it was also um, a little understood by me because of the fact of the times that I grew up. I grew up in the 90s where it was not as big of a deal to uh, provide your mental diagnosis, right? Nobody spoke about anxiety or that I have depression or that I have autism or ADHD, whatever it may be. It was all supposed to be uh, stayed inside that it wasn't really spoken about. And through this kind of quote, it really motivates me to make sure that I understand that it doesn't matter the child and somebody asked earlier about you know does functionality matter and i say it doesn't because autism is there and it what's so much more significant is what is it that an individual wants to accomplish and what is it that you as that parent or guardian wants to accomplish for your child that really matters to me and so i focus on in my practice hopes dreams and a desire for them to just be themselves and be happy so i didn't speak until age five all of that work that my mother did when i was diagnosed at three took years before i was able to get to this point and although I didn't really speak on it, and I again, I get this stereotype of, oh, you don't really look like there's a lot of problems going on. What isn't seen is that I was aggressive when I was a younger kid. I had self-entry up until, honestly, I was probably 24 or 25, where I would take a book and I would hit myself, or maybe I would hit a table uh, when I was really upset because I didn't know how to appropriately communicate those. Thankfully, now I'm a lot more self-sufficient in that way. But again, transparency is important to me. Uh, and and so even if these behaviors are happening, right, it's it's significant to understand that a, a neurodivergent individual is going to struggle. I struggled. I was bullied until the fourth grade and, and to a point where even my teachers, when I was in first or second grade, my mother would try and fight for me to say, hey, he needs more accommodations. He needs more resources. And my teachers, and this is an awful thing to repeat, but my teachers would say, well, if he wasn't just so weird, then this wouldn't be happening to him. Maybe if he was a little bit more normal, he would make some friends. And that just blew my mind. Of course, I didn't hear that. They they wouldn't dare say that in front of me. Um, but even so, they may have, because maybe they didn't think that I would understand that. But my mother sure understood it and thought that that was absolutely ridiculous. And by the end of the fourth grade, or until the fourth grade, excuse me, I was eventually then put into a different uh, structured program at my school where I was able to make friends to a point where even my um, 
friend from fourth grade was the person that married my wife and I. She was the the individual that was able to bring us together. And that was just really fantastic. Neurodivergency also doesn't just impact the functionality. It also can impact dating. The idea that our children are going to be married one day, maybe have a wife or a husband or a significant other is always in the back of our minds. That that's something that we'd, we would like, that they're not going to live at home. But for me, it was incredibly difficult. It was incredibly difficult to date, especially, and I, I was terrified in the in the early 2000s in 2010s area when I would hear more and more like, oh, well, if you want to meet somebody, you have to go to uh, a bar or a book, uh, a book area or a coffee shop or go to dinner and find them, right? And these in-person moments. Thankfully for me, uh, online dating became a lot more popular. And for me, that was a lot more significant and it may help out your your children as well uh, your teenagers and 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 more so adults obviously but being able to to do something like that because for me it was easier to type what I was feeling or what I wanted to say instead of saying it on the fly and being really embarrassed and not maybe being able to say it at all and not have that opportunity I met my wife on online dating and I told her after the second date I was too nervous to tell her on the first date that I had autism and by the second day, she was like, no, I, I know. I knew you had autism. And I was like, what? I didn't think you knew that. And she was like, no, it was it was pretty obvious to tell that. Um, and, and we went into that. And that just became a collaborative kind of joke for us that we were able to accept myself uh, for something that I just had a lot of shame about. Up until my early 20s, I was ashamed of having autism. Because again, the 90s, 2000s, you just wanted to fit in. It wasn't something that... Uh, people would welcome as much as today. And, but because of her and because of everything that my family was able to do, I started accepting it more. And dating, as scary as it was, led me to somebody that I could see myself with for the rest of my life. And to a point where even my own quirks, I mentioned earlier about my aggression and things, and that's all long gone, but I still have maybe my stereotypy, my hand flapping, if you would. Um, and I do that when I get really excited. And she says jokingly that that's how she knows she got me a good Christmas gift or a good birthday gift because I start to hand flop whenever I get uh, really excited about things that I get. There was one year um, for Christmas on a side note, just a funny thing for all of you, that I didn't hand flap for a gift that she got me for Christmas. And she pulled me aside later and said, so I noticed that you didn't flap your hands. What was that about? <laughs> and I had to tell her, no, I love the gift. I was just overwhelmed by a lot of things. So that was always really funny for us. Um, masking here, as and many may know this term and may not know this term, is that it, it's when we have to put on some kind of face to allow us to be considered, quote unquote, that normal and not be looked at differently, right? As I mentioned, I may be wanting a hand flap right now because I'm excited or I'm nervous or all of these things. But that's not really professional at that point. If that's all I did during this presentation, I don't think each, you know, everyone would sit here and watch that. Uh, but I have to put on this mask and, and be more appropriate in that way, right? And that's something for a neurodivergent perspective happens a lot of the time with individuals on the spectrum that they may, if they're acting one way, and this is a story I get from a lot of parents, that they may get really positive results at school or in their extracurricular activities, but not so much when they're home, right? And that's the idea that the mask is put on during the day, but not so much in the in the evening time when I'm with, when they're with families, because they think that families aren't going to go anywhere, but maybe their friends at school will. So it's there. But what happens, though, unfortunately, is that it becomes very exhausting to have to keep this mask on to just try and be someone that you're really not. Right. But for the sake of society, and we'll go into that a little bit more as we get into employability. But it's also having this idea that we can be ourselves. And I think as we continue on through the years, there's going to be more and more acceptance of letting people with autism be themselves and hopefully not have to wear that mask anymore. Right. But this there's this unemployability here. And it's also unenjoyability here where for myself, I had to go from job to job to job because of the fact that people that was were initially saying how grateful or welcoming they were that I had autism that they would say, oh, anything you need, you know, we'll do it for you, right? It came to a point that that had a stopping point, that when I would ask for certain um, accommodations or certain aspects, is that I would start to hear, well, so-and-so doesn't need that. Why do you need that? Because of the fact, again, that I may not look like I have this neurodivergence, 
Uh, but I do. And so it eventually would lead to performance plans. It would eventually lead to having to find another job before I was fired um, to a point where it just made me again, it wasn't enjoyable, that I was very unhappy, that all these places that I thought were going to be great fits that I could spend the rest of my life at was, was not the case, right? To a point where I realized, again, thanks to my very much support from my family and my wife, that why don't, if I'm not going to fit somewhere, why don't I just create somewhere for myself? And thus creating Autism International Consulting, where I can provide therapy, because I was really good at the therapy section, but maybe not so much at the social section, where it needed to be going to happy hours after work. And that was incredibly difficult for me, having to accomplish uh, and, and keep this mask on for longer than expected, just for the sake of maintaining some kind of social positivity, right? And this is the case for a lot of individuals on the spectrum, that the unemployment rate is so much higher for those on the spectrum that it's just not as doable. And so what I try to do again in my own therapy is, is provide these kind of supports because I've gone through it too. I've gone through those points where I was maybe a week or two away from being let go from a job just because I wasn't social enough. A performance plan I remember vividly was that I, I got it because I my humor was too dry, essentially, that I was making jokes, but they seemed too serious and that I needed to change my tone. And if anyone is aware, tone with individuals on the spectrum is incredibly difficult to change. And, and so that was a very interesting um, uh, performance plan at that time, right? But also one thing for us in the growth is being able to finally manage my life, but with support. I have, again, I cannot stress enough, my family, my sister, my, my wife, helping me through these things. My business is successful, but it's through the support of my family and my sister who manages uh, the financial uh, and accepting and being transparent enough to say, hey, I do need help. And that's where the self-advocacy comes from. Thanks to the support of my family, I've been able to learn how to self-advocate. And through each one of you supporting your own individual, that could be a possibility as well. So you don't need to worry about reading all of this. I'm going to skim through some of this, right? But if you want to take notes, you're more than welcome to. These are just little statistics on what we have realized for diagnoses, as well as unemployment and education, that there are very, very little, as you can see, 0.7 to 1.9% uh, of college students that identify as autistic. And we have to under we have to ask why, right? And I, I personally believe, and this is again in 2011 that this occurred, that I personally believe at that time, it was less accepting to say that you have autism. In college, I didn't say I had autism. And it was because I didn't want my friends to look at me differently. I didn't want them to see me as somebody that they wouldn't want to be around. And I also didn't want to be uh, looked at differently by my professors and maybe uh, think harshly or say, well, why is he even here in the first place if he can't handle college with their own kind of stereotypes? Something I wanted to, to get away from. And you'll see that that self-disclosure is a barrier for a lot of individuals with autism. And it still is. And it's why masking is so prevalent, right? In the same viewpoint as well, it got to a point when I would apply for jobs and everyone sees this in your job applications, it says, do you have a disability? Yes, no, if so, what is it? I would never put on there that I have autism because more often than not, my friends that have autism as well would say that they wouldn't get the job, that they may be as experienced or may have gone to college and have that master's or doctorate, but because that they had said autism, they realized that that was the reason why, that somebody that was less qualified would get it and not them. And I didn't want that to happen to me. And I would wait until I already had the job to, to disclose that and try and get those accommodations. But as I mentioned earlier, it was a lot difficult still to get that kind of acceptance that I was looking for. Uh, and it's something to, to really keep in mind that I wish that more businesses would provide that kind of support to, uh, to individuals on that spectrum. Graduation rates are also uh, significantly lower than other students. Those that are on the spectrum are going to graduate from college at a 38.8% rate, as opposed to a 60% rate by neurotypical children. And that's really difficult. In addition to that, there's this kind of double standard here in difficulty that those with diagnoses happen less with Black individuals, Latinx, and female children for different reasons, right? I'm of Hispanic descent. My father was from Monterey. Excuse me, my father was from Monterey, and it was harder for him to accept that I had autism. A lot of the times, and my mother was telling me more of this, is that she he would say, well, he'll just all grow it. 
he's just going to get out of this. It's no problem at all. And that he's he's going to be able to be just like every other kid. And it happened up until the point where they started putting me in more structured classes and more life scale, self-contained classes that he realized, OK, something needs to be done. But happens more often than not that I don't get children um, until significantly later in life. Because again, mental health is not spoken of oftentimes in the Latin community. It's something that isn't really wanting to be spoken of because of the embarrassment, possibly, maybe because of the denial of it. Same thing with female children is that it's less diagnosed in females than it is males because of the fact that it says from other research articles that uh, female individuals and female children mature faster than their male counterparts. And so they seem that they are older and doing well socially. But in addition, the social standard with females and males is significantly differently as well, where it's more isolation for females, as opposed to maybe seeing more aggression within males. And so for the average individual, it may be that seeing a female by themselves it's, oh, they just wanted to be by themselves. They're reading a book. They'll escape from in their book and all of these things. And in actuality, it's because they don't have friends. And that's what's really hard is to really bring that kind of education and knowledge to those that matter, the schools, the professors, anyone to see, hey, this person may be not just isolated or by themselves for a reason. It may be because they don't have anyone else to turn to. It's something to really uh, be significant, right? And I don't want to be morbid by any means, but also something to keep in mind because it's there is that the suicidal ideation is far more heavier with autistic individuals. Uh, because again, they have to hide who they are and it's it's incredibly difficult to manage. Again, with some more information here, is that we see um, a cycle of growth and also some lower rates of employment, as I mentioned. Again, these are studies that I got this from. Um, so in 2017, there's under, under, excuse me, underemployment is very pervasive. Um, as well as job loss. As I mentioned, I was on the verge multiple times of having a job loss. I was on the verge of having people not give me a job or even want me to stay on because they didn't feel that I was doing as good of a job. And that's really hard uh, because I am giving, you know, 110%, but I have some issues within myself that I may not be able to sustain. If I'm a manager, it's expected more often than not for them to show up to social hours to really present themselves as the face of the company. But for an autistic individual, that that can be very difficult uh, because you have to put on that face. You have to uh, make small talk. You have to make conversation. And that's just something that I'm not very strong at. Right. I tell my sister all of the time at my company, um, again, that networking is not my strong suit. Is <laughs> that if my sister can do it instead of me, that would be great uh, because it's just it, it's really hard to make that kind of conversation with people. But you'll see also that it's a far lower rate for those in autism. They have a percent of a work up to high school at 58 percent, where even those with a learning disability or an intellectual disability are even higher at getting a job and maintaining a job than that autism, uh, autistic individual may be able to as well. So what I would like to do right now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen to share another screen here. Uh, and what it is, it's and I'll give a brief detail because we're only going to see a couple of minutes of this is this is an individual that was on 60 Minutes. And some of you may have seen this article, but it was very uh, pertinent to me, of a non-speaking individual that has autism, who eventually was able to get her voice by using a picture exchange system. Um, now, it was through an iPad or a laptop, rather, at the time, where she was able to provide her wants and needs. And for the time that she was growing up with heavy, heavy behaviors, and I'm talking aggression, self-injury behaviors, and all of these things, she felt as if she could not really get her voice out there at a point where people were talking about her. But you'll see, and there's one funny moment in here as well, where she eventually does get a voice. And she asks the interviewer if he has a son her age. And he says he does. And she immediately says, well, is he cute? Because she is so invested again. Again, this is the idea that mindset change happens. These parents believed in, her, in their child that she was going to be able to speak and be able to provide her wants and needs. And sure enough, through their support, she was able to do just that. So let me go ahead and stop my screen. And I'll go ahead and share my new one. Um, right here, and I'll share my sound so that way you're able to hear it as well. Um, give me one second. Oh goodness. Um, so she started to realize that by communicating, she had power over her environment. And what came through her finger, typing one letter at a time with fluency no one could believe, was astonishing. I am autistic, but that's not who I am. Take time to know me before you judge me. I am cute, funny, and like to have fun. 
Through her torrent of words, Connie began to unravel the mysteries behind her often wild behavior. Like banging her head. Because if I don't, it feels like my body is going to explode. It's just like when you shake a can of Coke. If I could stop it, I would, but it's not like turning a switch off. I know what is right and wrong, but it's like I have a fight with my brain over it. Use your words. And Carly was not shy about expressing her desires and frustrations. I want to be able to go to school with normal kids, but not have them getting upset or scared if I hit a table or scream. I want something that will put out the fire. We were also uh, horrified because for years we had spoken in front of her as if she wasn't there. Now, for the first time, Carly was able to have conversations with her parents. You think you can write back to Dad? I want to go on a snowmobile. Can we do it? Will you go on one? I think it would be fun. So here's your daughter, and finally you get to meet her. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, overwhelming. <laughs> overwhelming. I stopped looking at her as a disabled person. You promised. Did you lie to me? And started looking at her as a sort of sassy, mischievous teenage girl. With. I want people to know that no one is telling me what to say. And I don't have a hand up my butt like a puppet. Carly has been very clear that she sees herself as a normal child, locked in a body that does things that she has no control over. Side by side with her twin sister, Taryn, it would be easy to dismiss Carly as intellectually challenged. That is, until you ask her a question. Carly, why do autistic kids cover their ears, flap their hands, hum, and rock? It's a way for us to drown out all sensory input that overloads us all at once. We create output to block out input. Carly's brain, unlike most people's, is overwhelmed by the senses of sight and sound, taste and smell. Our brains are wired differently. We take in many sounds and conversations at once. I take over a thousand pictures of a person's face when I look at them. That's why we have a hard time looking at people. The one thing she can control is when and where she'll type. Oh, this is John. This is John. And usually she needs to be motivated. Finish up. You're doing great. When I tried making conversation with Carly, she would not type back. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Her finger hovering over the keys for hours until I brought up my teenage son. He wants to play football. No, she's smiling. It's going to be something funny. <laughs> Are you embarrassed? <laughs> Come on, we want to hear what you have to say. Okay. Yes, I guess he's cute. You know, two years that we've been communicating, and every time she writes something, there's a little bit of that sense of awe. The room resembled a ship's cabin. Its walls Dear Dad, wooden I love when you read to me, and I love that you believe in me. I know I'm not the easiest kid in the world. Give me a kiss. However, you are always there for me, holding my hand and picking me up. I love you. I'll go through many sleepless nights to hear that. I'll spend every penny we have to hear that. Was there one writing in particular that left a lump in your throat? In this writing where she says, you've never been in my body, I wish for one day you could be in my body. <sighs> a year after we first met Carly, she is happier, calmer, more independent. Come on, let's get this in the pan. She's even writing a novel. I think that humankind is just oblivious to things that have been around for many years. She also has her own internet blog and Twitters regularly, answering questions from people all over North America. I think Carly knows that she now has a voice that can help other kids. Now she looks at herself as someone who can make a mark on the world. And that's got to be life-changing. What do you hope for Carly now? I want her to be happy. I want her to have dreams and goals and accomplish those goals in spite of her challenges. I think the only thing I can say is don't give up. Your inner voice will find its way out. Mine did. I appreciate all of you listening to that. Um, it's an absolutely inspiring individual. Um, so let me go back to our PowerPoint here. There we go. Awesome. So when you think about Carly, right, and you think about that ability for her to provide her wants and needs in that way, right? That was not expected. That, oh, excuse me, I think it's still going. One second, let me turn that off. 
yeah, now it's just an aquarium, which is pretty, but not why we're here. <laughs> uh, very cool. Um, so when we think about that, right, we think about this ability to have equality and accommodations and accessibility, that there are these opportunities for all three of these to occur, right? And we start seeing it that maybe we can have it, the employee look be looked at as an asset and taking into consideration their strengths and weaknesses, right? Just because they need an accommodation doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to not do well at their job. In fact, I've known a lot of individuals on the spectrum that have done an amazing job. And as I had mentioned earlier, a lot of them will also maybe even look into making their own business and making their own way of doing things, such as Carly creating a blog and being able to go on different kinds of talk shows and being able to be that advocate, right? It's important to also provide maybe accommodations to set this employee up for success. Just like anybody else that may need a little bit more support and when you're trying to learn something, an employee getting a small accommodation of an extra break here or there may not do a whole lot um, to, to impact your business, but it may mean a whole lot to those individuals that are getting that. And finally, the accessibility is that removing this kind of stigma that those on the spectrum are not able to do everything, right? I'm, cre I'm doing this presentation today to try and help that idea that individuals on the spectrum can do really anything they set their mind to. Being able to public speak is just one aspect of what an individual can do. I created Autism International Consulting. This company is meant to try and better support a lot of individuals on the spectrum, much like each one of you as a parent is trying to do that for your children as well. So the new neurodiversity kind of program here is, is gonna be this infinity symbol here, and that's why that's present currently, right? But this quote here is very significant where it says variations in neurological development and functioning across humans are a natural and valuable part of human variation and therefore not necessarily pathological. It's significant to understand that it's it's not that this makes somebody different by any means, right? It's just a different way of looking at things. And so it should be welcomed when we have neurodivergent individuals such as myself or others wanting to try and support uh, different kinds of programs, different kinds of fields to, to really keep that going, right? This concept of movement this diversity in all brains is as we continue to get older through the years here, right? Being able to understand that people are going to think differently than us. And it's significant to, to welcome those kind of changes, those opinions and those voices, because if we didn't, it's, it's very difficult to think that we may not have um, a lot of variation in what we're wanting, right? If we had people that just thought about like us all of the time, we wouldn't see a lot of progress, right? And it's one reason why I do these kind of presentations and say I welcome the transparency in the questions because I wanna make sure that everyone here is able to uh, get their voice heard as well as know that it's an open door here, it's an open mind. There are two types of ways of looking at things currently, right? There's a medical model and a social model. The medical model here is saying that they're, this individual, because they have this diagnosis or this disability or this concern, isn't able to do things because of X, right? When in actuality, maybe we need to look at things more in a social model where we start saying, oh, well, if this person has X, Y, Z thing, maybe we could do this instead to really include them, to really allow them to be a part of something, right? Oh, the cafe doesn't have Braille or an electronic menu option. Maybe that's something we look into, right? I went to the new Kansas City airport and they have a huge communication board where they provide um, all of these different words that individuals can use in order to uh, better support their wants and needs. Instead of having to just cry or scream or whatever it may be, being able to give that option, right? So it's understanding that a person with a disability can acquire that same information, they can engage in these interactions and also enjoy those same kind of services, right? Just like anybody else, it just may take a little bit or it may need that kind of support from each of you, right? But they are able to do it. I have a patient currently where the mother was feeding him, he's seven years old. And I said, oh, well, he can, you know, try and feed himself. And she said, no, no, I have to feed him because otherwise he's not going to do it, right? And that kind of thought, thinking, that mindset did not, he, he accepted that. And was like, oh, okay, I guess mom needs to feed me. But once we were able to convince her and say, no, give him a shot, he can feed himself. All of a sudden now he's using a, a, for, a fork, a spoon, a knife and doing all of these things to be able to feed himself. Again, it, it really deals with that kind of uh, mindset that you have for, for your child. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and we had a question earlier that I didn't um, come over with you to. Um, do you also have RBTs available to um, work in home if needed and does Medicaid cover that? 
Yes. Um, no, that's a good question. We do. So we work, so it's myself, BCBA, and as well as several other BCBAs. It's not just me. I can't run the ship by myself. Um, as well as having all registered behavior technicians. We only hire registered behavior technicians um, because they have more experience and the in-home is also something that requires more responsibility. So Medicaid does cover that. Um, and they also cover it for all private insurances as well. So it, it really allows that kind of um, support that you're looking for. The registered behavior technicians provide the direct therapy, but I provide all supervision and parent trainings as well. That's a really good question. That's very exciting. Somebody said, I'm so excited. One thing I, and I'm sorry, I don't want to like derail your slides or anything oh, like that, fine. but one thing that's really, really important to me that you share with everybody, because clearly you're doing well. I mean, you, you've done well, you've gone to college, you've got a master. I mean, you've, you have defied all of the odds. So before we finish today, I want to make sure that you kind of give some key components of what that how how you got there um Absolutely. because um the fact that you didn't speak until you're five years old i mean that's a that's a big deal and so um i want inquiring minds want to know we want to know this so please do share Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll go ahead because this is all people can take notes and I want to make sure everyone gets as much as they want here. Right. Um, is that for myself, it was I, I cannot stress enough. And I've said this throughout the presentation. If, if it wasn't for the support system for my mother and my father and my sister, I would not be where I am today. Right. But it was giving naturalistic opportunities to myself growing up that allowed me to learn how to speak and allowed me to try and make some friends. So I'll go into more details with that. Right where we speak on the idea that if our child is not currently speaking, giving them opportunities to speak. So maybe if they want to go into some kind of room, their bedroom, the bathroom, whatever it may be, that path is blocked. And you ask them, hey, you can tell me what you want. And getting them to say more, my turn, go, whether that's through words, whether that's through sign language or picture cards, whatever it may be, that's very significant. Um, but it's also understanding that a typical child is going to request their wants and needs about 400 times a day. So if you feel like, oh, I'm asking my child too much to ask me things, don't feel that way. You have plenty of time to ask them all of these things, right? A lot of the times what, my, what we may do as well is while they're eating, maybe move their plate and have them say my turn if they want it back. And we just give it right back to them because they said it, right? Or like I said earlier, is giving that opportunity to play with them with a toy and they say no, then we say, okay, thanks for telling me. Because it allows that confidence to grow. By no means, as I mentioned as well, I was bullied as I grew up, right? I didn't have a lot of friends be when I was growing up, up until about fourth grade when I was able to change. But it was significant for me to learn self-advocacy. So again, I cannot stress enough where you provide your child with self-advocacy options, right? The no, as I mentioned earlier, is very significant. But maybe you start giving them choices where you say, hey, do you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt? And giving them that option to be able to do that. When I was growing up, that was often what my parents did. And I looked mismatched, sure, but I was also five. So it didn't matter. It was also seven and it didn't matter, right? I was a little kid. But being able to wear what I wanted, self-advocacy really, really played a role here, right? Of being able to allow me to, to speak to these, um, speak for myself. Uh, getting your kids are going to have opportunities here where they may be nervous or scared or concerned about going to certain things. And again, I'll give an example of a 17 year old because this spans throughout a person's life, right? It's this idea that um, he, the 17 year old wanted to go to this game day at his school, but he was so nervous because some individual that he did not like was going to be there. And we provided the opportunity of saying, Hey, if you go to this game day, then we will take you to get ice cream after because that will be such a good job. And understanding how to use reinforcement to your benefit at that point. And he did it. And in, that person didn't even show up that he was so scared about. So he would have missed a whole social opportunity if it meant that he was not going to um, see that person, right? And so using reinforcement to your benefit, right? If you're wanting your child to speak or to have uh, to be able to practice some things or try things that they're not used to, understanding how to use that reinforcement. Hey, if you do this, then we will go ahead and do this, right? Another example is that I, I did not have concerns with the dentist, but I have a patient that is. And we work with a parent on understanding, hey, if they have trouble with doing things in his mouth, because the dentist has to go in your mouth, then giving them that opportunity 
um, to, to provide that kind of support where it's like, hey, hey, what do you want to work for? What do you want to do right now? And they were like, I want to open the garage. And I was like, okay, I mean, if that's your thing, then I said, first, let's go ahead and practice with this tool. It was a toy tool, so don't worry. Um, toy tool, and then we can open the garage. And having that trust and building that trust, that's so significant. Building the trust between you and your child and saying, okay, good. We did my thing. That's all done. Now we go ahead and do your thing is, is so significant uh, for them as well. Another patient we have is the idea that there are these behaviors where he didn't want his his father to uh, watch a certain thing on television. He was watching football and he wanted to watch Despicable Me. And he was like, no, no football, only Despicable Me. And that was an advocacy moment, but the child has to understand that that's not acceptable to do. And so we moved toward the idea of first, we need to see something that I wanna watch and then you can see your thing, right? So to sum it all up here as well, and I just want to make sure everyone is, you know, getting what they're looking for, is giving opportunities to have conversation or speak, whether that's sign language or, or words, right? Having trust built amongst you and your child and being able to have them understand that first they have to accomplish X before they get Y. And then also being able to self-advocate for their wants and needs as well. Being able to accept when things are being told to you that say no and saying, okay, that's no problem. Thanks for telling me. And knowing the difference between what is acceptable to say no to and what is not acceptable, right? So by no means, if he says, no, I don't want to eat dinner, give me candy. Are you supposed to say, yeah, that works for me. But instead, it's going to be more about, no, uh, this X, Y, Z thing has to happen first before we do that. So I hope that helps. And Allison, I hope that's also what people were looking for. Um, yes, that very aspect. good. So, Thank you. So to, to sum it all up here, right before we end, is just this viewpoint on my life of what's happened. In 93, there are very little people that had the diagnosis of autism, one in 1,000, uh, and very low knowledge. But in 10 years, it went from one in 1,000 kids with autism to one in 25. And now there was more acceptance of medical therapy. Again, my company, Autism International Consulting, provides that um, to, to, to be accepted for a medical diagnosis. In 2013, one in 59 kids had it, but there was growth in therapeutic providers. But we start seeing a lot of concerns here as we continue. 2023, one in 36 kids now have it. And there's a lot of evidence-based journal articles that can better support um, others as well as a wide variety of services. But in 2033, the chance is gonna be likely that that ratio will continue to increase based on that increasing trend. But currently there's a labor shortage in my field as well as long wait lists. Currently, we're able to see people. We have enough staff, thankfully, where we're able to support um, anyone that's looking for services. Again, we take all insurances, and it's just significant to make sure that no one takes advantage of you. As the only autistic-owned ABA company, we want to make sure that we can do everything possible for your child, as well as supporting neurodiverse affirming care and self-advocacy and transparency. So I welcome you to continue to ask these questions. If you look at the bottom left here, that QR code is not the one Allison mentioned, that's for her. My QR code goes through our website. We also have a contact page where you can uh, provide your information and we can get you started on maybe looking into kidding therapy or maybe talking about parent training, right? Or if you just have a question about my life, I'm happy to do that too. Um, in, the, in the middle here, you're gonna see my email, Autism INTL Consulting. Um, as well as um, my phone number, 713-960-3677. You can find us also on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter at Autism INTL. So please come by, say hi. I really thank all of you for being here. And for those that are tuning in by video, I appreciate all of you checking in as well. And truly, Allison, thank you for your time and, and allowing me to have this honor. So I appreciate each of you here today. Absolutely. Thank you, Armando. Um, you um, have really given us um, a story of um, hope. And, uh, you know, sometimes on the bad days, you know, I, I call them wheels on the bus, wheels off the bus at my house. That's what I call it. You know, on the bad days, it doesn't feel very, you may not as feel as hopeful and optimistic as you once were. But seeing someone and, and someone, quite honestly, that didn't have the financial wherewithal or backing as a child to get all of the support that you could have um, received, but that you, here you are, here you are with an international company. It's so awesome. So I would like to just um, personally thank um, everyone for their attendance today. Everybody is going to get a copy of his slides uh, today. 
Um, it'll have his contact information on there, our contact information. Uh, you can reach uh, CPG at um, 281-690-1177, 281-690-1177 if you like to talk. If you like to just schedule, you can use our uh, QR code and it'll take you to our calendar. Thanks, everyone. I got one o'clock, so we're going to wrap up for today, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks again, Armando. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.